Greetings and thank you for joining us today for One in Eight, The Realities of Sexual Violence Against Youth in Detention. I'm Vivian Hohola, Program Director at JDI, and I will moderate today's session. I want to again take a moment to thank all of you for joining us. Just Detention International is a nonprofit health and human rights organization that works to end sexual violence in all forms of detention. We have three core goals to our work. To hold government officials accountable, to change attitudes about sexual violence behind bars, and to ensure survivors get the help that they need. We were founded over 30 years ago by survivors of sexual abuse and detention who wanted to raise awareness of this human rights crisis. Since that time, we've provided information and support to every survivor who contacts us. JDI receives more than 2,000 letters a year, or about 200 a month, from people who have been sexually abused in custody. The number of people who reach out to JDI is steadily increasing, and in February alone, we received 600 letters. Much of what we know about this violence comes directly from survivors. Survivors have always driven JDI's work, and we're very proud of the courage and dedication of our founders. We'd like to take a moment to thank the Office on Violence Against Women for its generous support of this webinar and our Sexual Violence in Detention Education and Resource Project. This webinar is the first in a series of three webinars on youth detention. The purpose of this webinar is to assist community-based rape crisis organizations and other service providers to understand the issues that survivors face in juvenile detention. The second part of the series will focus on corrections and community partnerships. The third part will focus on providing services to youth in detention. Today's webinar will cover the following topics. An overview of the juvenile justice system, the Prison Rape Elimination Act, the prevalence of sexual abuse of youth in custody, LGB, LGBTQ youth, the dynamics of sexual abuse, a survivor conversation on impact, and a question and answer period. Just a quick note on terms. JDI will use the term resident to refer to detain youth because that's the language used within the PREA standards. Our other speakers on this webinar might use different terminology to refer to the youth residents. The term offender used to describe someone who has been charged with a crime is sometimes used, as well as detainee. If there's a term that comes up that's confusing, please use the question box and a JDI staff member can assist you. You can submit questions or requests for help and comments through the question box at any time. This webinar is being recorded and will be emailed to you in the next few days. It will also be posted on the National Sexual Violence Resource Center site. We're now going to begin by hearing from Jody Marksmer, who will give us an overview of the juvenile justice system for those who are not familiar with it. For more than eight years, Jody Marksmer was a staff attorney and youth project director at the National Center for Lesbian Rights, NCLR where he led NCLR's policy and advocacy work on behalf of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender youth in juvenile justice settings. From 2005 to 2011, Jody was one of the coordinators of the Equity Project, a collaboration between NCLR, Legal Services for Children, and National Juvenile Defender Center, working to improve fairness and respect for LGBT youth in delinquency courts across the country. While at NCLR, Jody also coordinated national efforts to address sexual abuse in juvenile facilities, prisons, and jails, and was an invited expert speaker on this topic at a National Prison Rape Elimination Commission hearing in 2005. A prolific writer, Jody has published numerous journal articles and other publications related to youth in state custody. Welcome to the webinar, Jody. Great. Thank you very much, Vivian, and thank you to JDI for inviting me to, here today to participate in this important webinar. And um, welcome to all those who are on the phone. Um, I'm going to uh, provide an overview of the juvenile justice system, a breakdown of who is locked up in juvenile facilities and for what types of offenses, and some more some basic information on experiences that young people have in juvenile facilities. To begin, uh, juvenile courts were created over a century ago based on the belief that youth are more amenable to treatment than adults, 
and therefore when they engage in behavior that violates the law, they should be treated in a separate system that provides for rehabilitation rather than punishment. In line with this belief, most states have statutes explicitly stating that the purpose of juvenile delinquency court intervention includes the provision of treatment and rehabilitation. Because juvenile court focuses on treatment for youth rather than punishment, the juvenile system has developed a different set of terms than those used in adult criminal courts. For example, young people in juvenile court are most, are most often referred to as respondents rather than defendants. Youth in juvenile courts are not convicted of crimes, instead they are adjudicated delinquent or found to be delinquent. And instead of receiving a set sentence, youth receive disposition orders from the court. Current adolescent development research supports the fundamental premise of juvenile courts that society should respond to youth crime differently than adult crime. However, the juvenile justice system has taken an increasingly punitive approach to youth behavior. Over the last few decades, many states have shifted the focus of their juvenile courts to a more punitive model of client accountability and public safety, minimizing or even eliminating treatment and rehabilitation programming. Today, juvenile courts are now incarcerating thousands of children in prison-like facilities that provide little, if any, treatment, and that too often are overcrowded and unsafe. Unlike in the adult system, where most people are incarcerated in prisons and jails, the juvenile system uses a variety of types of facilities, and different jurisdictions refer to these facilities with different names. There are juvenile halls or detention facilities for youth pre-adjudication and awaiting placement. As part of their disposition, Youth can be sent to boot camps, ranches or wilderness camps, residential treatment centers, training schools, youth study centers, and numerous other places. Although the names of many of these facilities include words like school or camp, these facilities more closely resemble adult jails and prisons than any school or camp you may be familiar with. In more than three quarter of public juvenile facilities, kids sleep in locked cells in locked units. In addition, many of these facilities report locking kids in their cells or sleeping rooms whenever these uh, young people are in these rooms, day or night. And a small percentage of facilities go beyond this, locking kids in their cells or sleeping rooms for most or all of each day. In urban areas, juvenile facilities are separate from adult facilities, but in smaller jurisdictions or in rural areas, these facilities may be connected or they may not even have a specific juvenile facility. In these cases, juvenile and adults are housed in the same facility, but in separate units. Under federal law, confined juveniles are supposed to be sight and sound separated from adults at all time. Unfortunately, this does not always happen, which places the youth at very high risk of sexual assault. In addition, juveniles who have, ha who have their cases heard in adult courts rather than juvenile courts can be incarcerated with, with adults without violating this federal law. On any given day, there are as many as, 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 ten, are as, as 10,000 children in adult jails and prisons. In most jurisdictions, kids who are sent to juvenile facilities by the court are not sent to a facility for a specific length of time like most adults are. Instead, youth can only be released from the facility if it is determined that they are rehabilitated or they have completed their court-ordered program successfully. If neither of these things happen, the youth will be held until they age out of the juvenile justice system and the court no longer has jurisdiction to hold them. The age at which kids age out of juvenile facilities varies from 18 to 25. That means a 16-year-old who steals a car with an 18-year-old could end up locked up for many more years than, than the 18-year-old would be. Next slide, please. So how many young people are we talking about? Who are they? And what did they do to end up behind bars? According to the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, who, bi who biannually takes a census of all youth who are held in juvenile placements, on the most recent census day in 2010, there were 70,792 youth in juvenile facilities. The number of juveniles locked up has been steadily decreasing since peaking in 1997. It's not that the courts today are less likely to lock kids up. Rather, this, de this decrease is in line with an overall decrease in the number of delinquency cases that are, that are heard in the courts. Youth of color are vastly overrepresented at every stage of juvenile delinquency proceedings, and they are confined in juvenile justice facilities at highly disproportionate rates. 
For example, according to a 2007 National Council on Crime and Delinquency report, African Americans comprised 16% of the overall youth population in the United States, but represented 28% of juveniles arrested, 37% of the detained population, and 38% of youth in residential placement. Numerous studies have documented that these disparities are not attributable to higher rates of offending among African American youth. On Census Day in 2010, 41% of juveniles in residential placement were African American. 32% were white, 22% were Latino, 2% were Native American, 1% were Asian American, and 2% had other racial or ethnic identities. The number of girls in juvenile facilities has dramatically increased in the last 10 years, although girls still only make up approximately 13% of the total population. But girls are more likely to be locked up for low-level offenses than boys. And in addition, girls who are locked up are more likely to be younger than boys. Juvenile facilities can house kids as young as 10, years, 10 or 11 years old and as old as 25. While the number of young people at either end of this range tends to be small, 12% of boys and 16% of girls in juvenile facilities are 14 years old or younger. And on the other end of that spectrum, 15% of boys and 8% of girls are 18 years old or older. More than half of kids in juvenile facilities, though, are 16 or 17 years old. The vast majority of young people in juvenile facilities are locked up for nonviolent offenses. In 2010, only 28% of boys and 15% of girls in juvenile facilities committed or were accused of committing a violent felony. On the other end of the spectrum, 3% of boys and 11% of girls in these facilities were locked up for non-criminal behaviors, such as running away, truancy, incorrigibility, and underage drinking. These behaviors are most often referred to as status offenses because they are non-criminal in nature but are, but are unlawful as a result of the minor's age. In addition, approximately 7% of boys and girls were locked up for drug offenses, while another 7% were locked up for public order offenses. Finally, a very significant portion of the total population in juvenile facilities, 16% of the boys and 22% of the girls, were there not for a new offense, but because of a technical probation violation that they committed. Youth with mental health issues, learning disabilities, and histories of trauma disproportionately comprise the, comp the population of youth in juvenile facilities. For many of these youth, the juvenile courts intervene in their lives after other child-serving systems including mental health, education, and child welfare systems, have failed to provide them with the treatment or services that they need. In essence, the juvenile justice system has become the default mental health system for these low-risk, high-needs youth, even though the justice system is ill-equipped to serve them and often only succeeds in making things worse. This is particularly true for girls in juvenile facilities who have experienced very high rates of trauma prior to being locked up. Next slide, please. There are a number of factors that increase the risk of a young person getting involved in the juvenile justice system, including living in poverty, living on the streets, or being removed from their home and placed in a foster home or group home. In, a diff in addition, differences in policing practices and system responses to youth behavior is at play in low-income communities and communities of color. Many, many of, the, of the youth in these communities, as well as youth who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, are targeted by police and often stop for looking are, are often stopped for looking suspicious when they are simply out walking with friends. Many young people enter the juvenile justice system through what is often called the school to prison pipeline. Over the last 15 years, a new era of get tough approaches to misbehavior at school has resulted in a, lar in a, has resulted in a surge in school arrests for minor misbehaviors, such as disrupting class, talking back to teachers, schoolyard fights, and disorderly conduct. This has had a disproportionate impact on youth of color. Today, most urban schools and schools in low-income communities have significant police presence on campus, as well as metal detectors, starting in schools as young as grade school. This means that rather than being sent to the principal's office, like was the, like was the most common response when many of us were in school, students today are handcuffed, taken to the police station, and charged with an offense. Finally, experiences of trauma such as physical or sexual abuse at home, 
family rejection, bullying at school, or sexual exploitation can also place youth at higher risk of entering the juvenile justice system. Trauma at home can lead to running away, which in itself is a status offense. Many runaways end up living for some period of time on the streets where they engage in minor criminalized behavior in order to survive. In addition, in many places, simply sleeping on the street can result in arrest. Some youth who experience trauma self-medicate with drugs or alcohol, once again creating a pathway to entering the juvenile justice system. Next slide, please. Being behind bars has a serious negative impact on many children. Often this is the first time this young person is away from their family. This is particularly tough on the youngest kids. Juvenile facilities in many jurisdictions are large, impersonal facilities, far from home. This makes it difficult for families to regularly visit with their children. It's difficult for youth to maintain support systems from their communities, which makes coming home and reintegrating much more difficult. In addition to the loss of liberty and separation from family and support, Detention and incarceration subject youth to risk of serious physical and sexual abuse within the facilities at, at the hands of staff members as well as other youth. Many facilities are also overcrowded, leading to unsafe sanitary conditions and unworkable staff to youth ratios. Some facilities are dilapidated and others have bug or vermin problems. Also few facilities have acceptable education or mental health services. The long-term consequences of incarceration on children are also severe. For example, youth who have been confined are more likely to recidivate and less likely to complete high school, obtain employment, and successfully transition into adulthood. For all of these reasons, youth behind bars are in real need of advocates, especially those who experience sexual assault and abuse. Thank you so much, Jody, for that great overview of the youth criminal justice system. It's so important to educate advocates on the different forms of incarceration that exist for youth. Now we're going to switch over to Derek, who will examine the laws that are now in place to protect young people who are under the government's custody from sexual abuse. Derek Murray is a JDI program director. He's been helping to implement the Prison Rape Elimination Act standards in state-run facilities long before the release of the final standards and provides technical assistance to corrections and victim service agencies. Currently, Derek oversees a project to provide training to law enforcement and community advocates to prevent the sexual abuse of juvenile detainees. Thank you so much, Vivian. So first we're going to talk about the Prison Rape Elimination Act. So survivors and human rights activists were instrumental in securing passage of national legislation that holds um, government officials accountable for ending sexual violence and detention. In 2003, the Prison Rape Elimination Act, or what we'll call PREA for short, was the nation's first federal civil law addressing this issue. JDI survivors and a broad coalition of non-governmental organizations worked closely with members of Congress on both sides of the aisle to help secure the unanimous passage of PREA. Since that time, we've played a key role in PREA's implementation at the federal, state, and local levels. The law has three objectives. The first is to provide funding for corrections agencies to combat sexual abuse and detention. It also provides yearly statistical research on the prevalence of sexual abuse behind bars, and this is carried out by the Bureau of Justice Statistics, or the BJS for short. And lastly, it mandates the creation of national standards, which are really rules and regulations that all corrections must abide by. These uh, standards are part of the reason why you're here today. So now let's take a little quiz, if, uh, if it loads up, uh, to test your knowledge on the PREA standards so we can get a better feel of um, how to proceed when discussing PREA. So the question is, the Prison Rape Elimination Act uh, standards mandate uh, the first of uh, the first response is advocates to provide crisis intervention services to victims or corrections to find community based resources for victims or uh, the standards mandate advocates to meet with violent criminals in locked rooms. Uh, what do you think is the best answer? I'm just going to give you a couple seconds to respond. And the question again is the Prison Rape Elimination Act standards mandate one of these things. Please choose the best uh, response. Okay, I think that's, uh, let's just get the results right now of this quiz. 
Sorry, I'm having a little trouble with that. Carolina? Ah, uh, here we go. Okay, interesting, interesting, great. So the, the correct answer is actually um, the second one, correction to find community-based resources for victims. Um, that's the correct answer. The uh, standards actually don't mandate advocates to provide services to victims um, at all. Um, they actually mandate corrections to find um, the available resources for victims and their facilities. Um, moving on to the next um, section, and then for the, so we're going to discuss the standards to give you a better sense of history and then also the opportunity that the PREA standards create in providing services to, to youth. And I think we lost the slides. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to give you just a moment to get those slides back up. It's up for me. Where's the, where did it go? Okay, here we go, and now we're back. Okay, great. So um, the prison, the Prisoner Rape Elimination Act standards, or just the standards as we're going to refer to them, are a result of a seven-year process. Um, a bipartisan commission was appointed to research the issue and develop a set of rules. Uh, these standards went through several public comment and review periods and then were redrafted and released by the Department of Justice on May 17, 2012. They were the first federal guidelines of their kind and um, applied to corrections facilities nationwide. They are standards for adult prisons and, and jails, community confinement facilities, juvenile detention facilities, and then also for for lockups. They pertain to all aspects of custodial sexual abuse and they give instruction on how to prevent and respond to sexual violence. Um, finally, these standards are binding on all youth facilities. And some key highlights of the standards include um, uh, their standards for classification and screening. So within 72 hours of um, arrival and periodically through the agencies, uh, the agency obtains and uses information about a person's personal history and then also their behavior uh, to to make sure that those who are the most likely to be perpetrators are not housed um, with the most vulnerable. Also, um, we're going to go into more detail about who are the most vulnerable in a youth facility in just a little bit. And I was actually on the slide before this one still. If you want to keep it there, great. So um, the standards also um, require staff training on the dynamics of sexual abuse and then also sexual harassment, the common reactions of, of victims, how to detect signs of threatened, and then also actual sex, sexual abuse, and how to communicate effectively with lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and gender nonconforming residents. And then residents must also be educated on their rights to be free from sexual violence, the agency's zero tolerance policy, and the different ways in which um, youth can report to, or to uh, seek your services. Um, residents will also not have to report in order to, to get services. There, there must also be multiple avenues for reporting and facilities must accept reports from third parties. For example, a, a facility must accept a phone call from a young person's mother reporting abuse and it should be taken as seriously as when a lieutenant reports an incident. And the credibility of alleged victim of abuse, the, sus the suspect and the witness shall be assessed on an individual basis and it shall not be determined by the person's status as a resident or staff. So the standards cover every aspect of corrections management and there's many more important safeguards and tools for staff to help make facilities safer, but unfortunately we can't go into greater detail of that today. But what we are going to talk about more today is the standards that pertain to service providers like yourself and then also what opportunities exist for you to provide services to youth detainees. So the PREA standards mandate that survivors receive forensic exams and emergency care for treating injuries and then also for collecting evidence. Um, there must be a coordinated response to sexual violence, much like that those uh, that are done in the community, where there are many different parts or many different hands involved in securing the crime scene, transporting the victim, and ensuring that the survivor is cared for by the most appropriate people to do that. Um, facilities also must make, uh, make a victim advocate from a rape crisis center available, and they have to document their attempts to do so.
Youth facilities are also required to allow survivors access to rape crisis advocates in as confidential a manner as possible and must enable re reasonable communication. And this is by way of mail, phone call, or in-person sessions. And they have to provide ongoing medical and mental health treatment consistent with the community standard of care. And they have to attempt to enter into working agreements with community service providers that are able to provide inmates with confidential emotional support. So advocates may partner with, um, with corrections for a variety of different activities surrounding sexual violence prevention response. On this slide is a number of opportunities for advocates and corrections to partner. Uh, together to provide in-person counseling to survivors, join institutional SARTs, train institution staff on the dynamics of sexual abuse as required by the PREA standards, or apply for federal grants together to implement this, the PREA standards. And we're going to go into more detail about these opportunities in session two of the series. Now that we've learned more about the juvenile criminal justice system and the laws that are now in place to prevent sexual violence and help survivors, let's look at some of the statistics around the issue. Okay, so let's tie these uh, two things together from what Jody talked about and from the PREA standards and take a look at why these standards are so important for youth in the system. So like I mentioned earlier, one part of PREA is National Statistical Surveys, released in 2010. The BGS survey asked youth in state and non-state correctional facilities about sexual victimization. Um, the study asked about the incidence of sexual abuse during a one-year time frame from 2008 to 2009. And from that study, it was, found that it was found that one in eight youth reported experiencing one or more incidences of sexual victimization. So that's one in eight youth were sexually abused in custody in a one-year time frame. An outstanding 81% of survivors reported more than one incident. 43% of victims reported more than one perpetrator, which tells that the, us that the majority of victims were abused multiple times and by multiple people. Youth were four times more likely to be abused by staff. Overall, 10.3% of respondents reported an incident involving staff, while 2.6% uh, of youth reported an incident involving another youth. For those who were sexually abused by staff, 4.3% were forced and 6.4% were not forced. Male staff were more likely to use force than female staff, but the overwhelming majority of staff sexual misconduct involved female staff and male victims. 95% reporting sexual misconduct said they were victimized by women who worked in the facility. And just to note that even though many respondents said that they were not forced by coercion, threats, or fear of physical violence, all these incidents uh, constitute sexual abuse because youth in the government's custody cannot freely consent to sexual activity with a staff member who is an authority figure and literally holds the key to their freedom. All th and then also 9% of victims of staff sexual abuse were under the age of 15 and in no jurisdiction is this ever, ever consensual. So the majority of youth on youth sexual violence was among girls. Female-only facilities had the highest rates of youth on youth violence. Youth with a previous history of sexual victimization were twice as likely to report victimization in their current facility. So it was about a quarter of survivors who were previously victimized out in the community were victimized within the facility. And then for youth who were previously sexually abused in another facility, let's say it was a juvenile hall or a camp, a majority of them, 65%, reported being victimized at their current facility within the year since admission. And then in boys' facilities, those who identify as non-heterosexual were targeted for sexual abuse at a higher rate than their heterosexual peers. <clears throat> Length of stay also has an impact on youth's vulnerability. Youth serving five or more months were more likely to be victimized than those who were staying less than five months. For youth on youth violence, sexual violence was most likely to occur in a common area. 65% that it happened said it happened in a place like a classroom, a library, an office, an office, a closet, or a supply room. 43% said it was in their room. 33% said it happened in another room or sleeping area. And finally, 45% said it happened in the shower area. 
the time that it was most likely to occur was between 6 p.m. and midnight. For staff on youth violence, 80% were raped in common areas. About half, 51% said they, that it happened in the shower or the bathroom, and half, 54%, said that it, they were raped in their cells. Again, the same time between 6 p.m. and midnight were the most common time of occurrence. So perpetrators tend to target, um, so for the many years that we've worked, um, worked on this issue, we know that anyone can be sexually abused in prison, but perpetrators tend to target these groups of people more, which are people with disabilities, mental illness, or previous history of trauma. Gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, or those who are perceived to be, or people who are gender nonconforming. Also younger inmates, people who are locked up for the first time, not street smart and not getting affiliated, people who are smaller or physically weaker than the perpetrator, people who are convicted of certain crimes like prostitution. So the, I'm going to ask a question to the audience. So why do you think these groups of people are targeted the most? Please submit your answers in the question box. And I'm just going to read these off as they come in. So why do you think these groups of people are most targeted um, by perpetrators? Someone says afraid to tell. Someone else says more vulnerable. They're less likely to report. They lack support. They're preserved as weak. Someone else said disenfranchised, unaware of their rights. Less likely to retaliate is another answer. Um, and then also that they are they don't have a good support system. Great. These are all wonderful, wonderful uh, responses. So, you, so you're all right. The people who are perceived as vulnerable, uh, perpetrators target them because they're less likely to fight back or tell whether that's true or not. And they're the ones that are singled out because these groups of people are less likely to be believed if they do tell. So thank you. Thank you so much for your participation in that. Thank you, Derek. We're now going to hear from our guest contributors today, Wesley and Crystal. Crystal Cortez is a 21-year-old transgender woman and a juvenile justice reform activist. Incarcerated at just 12 years old, Crystal survived the juvenile justice system in Louisiana and has turned her experiences into a positive force for change. Crystal has shared her story and insight for numerous reports and an article featured in The Nation magazine. In 2010, she was named Fiercest Queer by National Youth Advocacy Coalition. Wesley Ware is the director of Breakout, an organization dedicated to ending the criminalization of LGBTQ youth in New Orleans, Louisiana, and is a 2011 Soros U.S. Justice Fellowship recipient. He previously served as the LGBTQ Youth Project Director at the Juvenile Justice Project of Louisiana, where he authored the report, Locked Up and Out, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Youth in Louisiana's Juvenile Justice System. Wesley has published numerous articles and has helped to pass and implement policies for LGBTQ youth in New Orleans Youth Detention Center and is informed to juvenile justice standards and policy guidelines at the local and national level. Wes also serves on the advisory board for the Equity Project, a national initiative to bring fairness and equity to LGBTQ youth in juvenile delinquency courts. We're now going to turn it over to Wes, who will familiarize you with the unique risk that LGBTQ youth face in detention. Thank you for the introduction, Vivian. I'm happy to be speaking with you all today and very excited to be on a, on a webinar with Crystal, uh, who I've known for many years and whose courage and resilience continue to inspire me. Just so that we're all on the same page, LGBTQ means lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning, or some people reserve the Q for queer. A uh, lesbian is someone whose gender identity is that of a woman or a girl, of course, who is attracted to other women. Gay refers primarily to men or boys who are attracted to other men or boys, but can also be used as a blanket term that includes lesbians as well. Bisexual, of course, refers to people attracted to both genders. 
And transgender refers to someone who is assigned one biological sex at birth, such as male or female, but whose gender identity is different from their biological sex. So a transgender person might undergo medical procedures such as hormones or surgery to bring their outward appearance more in line with their gender identity. When we say transgender girl, we're referring to someone who is born male but identifies as a girl. And when we say transgender boy, we're referring to someone who is born biologically female but identifies as a boy. One of the most important things for us all to remember and understand is the difference between gender identity and sexual orientation. It's confusing because the L, the G, and the B are all examples of sexual orientation, who you're attracted to romantically, emotionally, or physically. But the T is more about gender identity. What gender do you see reflected back at you when you look in the, in the mirror? Who do you know yourself to be on the inside? Every person on this webinar has both a sexual orientation and a gender identity. Transgender people may identify as heterosexual, gay, lesbian, bisexual, or something else. We assume that people who are born with the biological sex of male will have a gender identity of a man and express themselves in a masculine way and be attracted to women. The reverse is true for people who are born biologically female. But we know that we can't make assumptions about people and that when we do make these assumptions about youth in particular, it can prevent us from being able to provide appropriate and relevant services to them. Next slide, please. Further, the American Psychological Association, the American Medical Association, the National Association of Social Workers, and other professionals all have statements that say that gender exists on the spectrum. So if you imagine masculinity on one side and femininity on the other, all people, regardless of, the bio of their biological sex, it's somewhere along the spectrum and may also move throughout time. Another important concept to understand is that this kind of diversity is normal and part of someone's core identity. It cannot be changed and in fact attempts to do so can be harmful. There's one last term that can be useful to know, especially when working with youth. That's the term gender nonconforming. Gender nonconforming can refer to anyone whose gender identity or expression is different from what's stereotypically thought of as traditionally masculine or feminine. We could do an entire training on these concepts alone, but more importantly, why does this matter when we're talking about youth and detention? One obvious way is that, unfortunately, no matter how someone identifies or expresses their gender, housing in many group homes, detention centers, or shelters depends on biological sex with no consideration of that youth's safety or comfort level. Later on in the webinar, we'll talk about some of the best practices for housing transgender or gender nonconforming youth. Next slide, please. LGBT youth are disproportionately represented in the juvenile justice system. At least 15% of youth in detention are LGBT identified. This makes sense when you think about it because LGBT youth are disproportionately represented in each feeder into the system. So if we think of all the contributing factors to someone entering into the juvenile justice system, just a few of them might be homelessness, school referral, discriminatory policing, mental health or substance abuse problems, and the other fears that Jody mentioned earlier in the webinar. LGBT youth are disproportionately represented in each of these feeder areas, especially transgender youth and LGBT youth of color. For example, LGBT youth make up at least 40 to 50 percent of the homeless youth population are at least three times more likely to bring a weapon to school. Gay and bisexual boys are 40 percent more likely to use substances. And LGBT youth, especially transgender youth of color, are more likely to experience police profiling or harassment. The list goes on and it's what we at Breakout refer to as the criminalization of LGBT youth. It's important that we note that we are primarily talking about youth of color. Although youth of color make up 38% of the youth population in the U.S., they compri comprise nearly 70% of those who are con confined. Earlier on in the webinar, Jody referenced the disproportionate minority confinement uh, in the juvenile justice system, and this, of course, affects LGBT youth as well. Many LGBT youth of color are coming into the system with a great deal of trauma already 
and experiences like Jody referenced earlier in the webinar. Next slide, please. So once LGBT youth enter into the juvenile justice system, they often experience the very worst of what the system has to offer. Courts, prosecutors, defense attorneys, probation officers, judges, detention centers, all have a role in causing a young person to receive longer sentences or be housed in secure confinement for longer periods of time. But since this webinar is largely about youth in secure confinement, we're going to focus on the back end of the system here. But it's important to note that training and policy reforms need to happen at every level of the system. Many detention, detention facilities are already unsafe for young people, but for marginalized or more vulnerable youth, they can be even worse. If a detention facility is gener generally unsafe, especially if it's unsafe for transgender youth, transgender youth may be put on protective custody or may elect to be put on protective custody. While this might keep a young person safe from harm, it often means that they're in isolation and unable to receive the rehabilitative programming that is supposed to be consistent with the juvenile justice system. There are laws and standards in place to ensure that LGBT youth are not placed in unnecessary isolation that others will go over later on in the webinar. Similarly, if the environment is unsafe, young people might fight back against attackers. I'll never forget taking a call a call from a young person inside a secure juvenile facility one day who was being attacked by other youth in the dorm. We advocated over and over again for staff, counselors, and even the warden to intervene, and yet the next time I heard from the youth, he was on lockdown finally fighting back. This, of course, leads to a poor institutional record for the child, which can have a direct impact on whether or not the young person is released early or stepped down to a lesser secure facility. This, of course, can lead to longer periods of trauma as well. We also know that any time in isolation can have extremely negative impacts on someone's mental health, which is another concern for LGBT youth who are placed on administrative segregation, lockdown, protective custody, or any other placement where they have little interaction with others. This chart also shows how youth may be seen as pathological or in need of help. I've known youth who were sent to sexual identity confusion counseling, told not to walk or talk a certain way because it was causing a distraction on the dorm, or punished for dancing on the dorm, for wearing their hair a certain way, and generally expressing their gender identity. I've also known gay-identified youth that were not allowed to talk to other gay-identified youth because the facility said that they acted too flamboyantly when together. Since you can't change aspects of one's sexual orientation or gender identity, this sends the harmful message to youth that they're wrong, they're sick, or otherwise deviant, when in fact it's a normal and healthy aspect of human diversity. Next slide, please. This slide further explains some of the abuses that can happen to LGBT young people in juvenile facilities. We already talked about some of these, but there's also the general bullying or harassment that may happen in facilities. Young people who are LGBT identified have been placed on sex offender treatment dorms or units even though they were never charged with a sex-related offense. For LGBT young people who have been charged with a sex offense, there is often little to no programming about healthy LGBT relationships and I've seen transgender young women forced to go through healthy masculinity classes as part of sex offender counseling. Of course, LGBT youth, like all youth, need programming that is relevant and affirming to them. Similarly, transgender boys and gender nonconforming girls tend to be isolated out of the assumption that they're perpetrators of sexual abuse. I've heard stories of lesbian identified girls in a girls detention center who were punished for opening doors for other youth on the dorm, which can actually be a normal and healthy expression of gender and varying gender roles. Crystal will go more into the kinds of experiences that LGBT youth often have in juvenile facilities in a moment, but it's important to note that all these things can be seen as violence, and youth who make complaints about such things, especially LGBT youth, can often be seen as asking for it or just generally not believed. Next slide, please. Derek mentioned the Bureau of Justice Statistics report from 2010, but it confirmed what young people had already been telling us and what JDI advocates had known for some time, 
which is that LGBT young people are way more likely to experience sexual abuse inside a juvenile justice facility than youth who are not LGBT identified. Next slide. And lastly, I want to end with a quote from a 15-year-old transgender young woman who was incarcerated in a boys' facility who I worked with uh, over several years. She says, we have a way harder life when we're incarcerated. Straight people have a hard time here, but gay youth have it even worse. They're raped, get food thrown at them, are jumped, humiliated. God knows what will happen to them. Thank you so much, Wesley, for helping us to understand the staggering challenges facing LGBT youth in detention. Now Crystal is going to share her personal experience in juvenile detention with us. Hi, um, my name is Crystal, and um, I was just I'm wanting to share my experience in the juvenile justice system. Well, whenever I first entered the system, I was 12 years old, and I was identified as gay men before um, before I identified as a trans woman, and identifying as a gay male there was very hard and stressful. It was um, it was something I wouldn't want to wish on anyone as you know as an experience to go through. Um, I was asked by several youth to have um, have some kind of you know some kind of um, sexual uh, acts with them and also the staff. Um, Every time that you wrote an ingredient or you, you, you told someone, they were always saying that you were lying or they were gonna do an investigation on it or just or just say that um, or just say that they were gonna they were gonna try to help you. Well, none of those things never got done. And uh, it was also asked to me by several officers to also do something with them and if I did something with them, they would um, they would give me something back in return, anything that I wanted, and um, and so you know I would do those things and get something back in return. But I felt belittled, and um, I felt belittled, and I just felt you know like lower, lower. I was like like you know lower than uh, myself. Um, and it's just it's just a very hard experience to go through. And the only thing that I can say that I, I turn my I turn all that negative uh, all that negative into a positive reaction by helping out today and trying to let you know what I went through. Well, Crystal, thank you so much. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to share with us? No. Was there anything else that you wanted to share with us? That's all that I can think about. Thank you so much for your powerful testimony. You're an incredibly brave young woman for coming forward, and your testimony is going to help future young people in the system, not only in getting the help that they need from outside advocates, to, but to make sure that the system is held accountable for the lack of strong policies and practices. A facility that's unsafe for transgender youth is not safe for anyone. At this point, you might have some questions. Um, speaking to the audience here. If you do, please write them in the chat box and our tech savvy program officer, Carolina, will gather your questions for the Q&A session, which will begin shortly after we look at the factors that um, contribute to sexual abuse and some of the dynamics and impact of this abuse. Great. Thank you so much, Vivian, and thank you so much, Crystal, for taking the time out of your day to um, speak with us. So let's start off by talking about some of the key factors that contribute to sexual abuse. The first factor to consider is leadership and accountability. Leaders who take this issue seriously send the message that sexual abuse will not be tolerated and that young people will be protected. 
perpetrators get away with abusing residents when administrators are lax on this issue. As in the case with Crystal, we saw staff getting away with ignoring requests for help and retaliating against young people for speaking out. Another factor to consider is the lack of staff training. Everyone, including custody, medical, and mental health, and investigators need training on sexual abuse prevention and response. There also needs to be training on clear boundaries between appropriate and inappropriate conduct. Sometimes staff can engage in displays of physical affection, such as hugging and kissing, under the guise of providing emotional support to youth, but which really meets, meets the staff needs for either gratification or control. We also run into problems when there's inconsistencies in staff application of the rules, where one person is more lax than the other, which really can lead to instability. Facility staff need to do more than just understand the policies. They need to share the goal of keeping all residents safe, no matter what. And then institutional culture and dynamics plays a huge role in sexual abuse. Um, sexual abuse doesn't happen in a bubble. Oftentimes there are people who may be aware or suspicious but don't know how to report the abuse or they're too afraid to come forward for, losing, for fear of losing their jobs or their safety depending if they're staff or uh, residents. We also have to look at how intolerance towards groups, especially those who are the most marginalized, contributes to sexual violence and what the facility can do to educate their staff on their role in being part of the solution to preventing violence. And then issues with facility deficiencies and overcrowding can contribute to this, to this violence. Remember the research I pointed out earlier, areas that youth were most likely to be abused were places where there are a lack of security cameras uh, or staff presence at that time. They are places like classrooms, offices, uh, closets that are most likely to be vacant after 6 p.m. So now we're now going to explore in greater detail the various forms of sexual abuse that occur in custody. Sexual assault is an act of violence. It does not express love, lust, or attraction. Just as in the community, sexual assault in youth facilities is used to establish power and control. It exists on a spectrum and is likely to increase in intensity over time if the perpetrator is not stopped. So as advocates, you are all at least familiar with many of these terms, so I'm not going to go into definitions, but I do want to give you examples of how these forms of sexual violence are manifested in a youth detention setting. So first we have sexual harassment, which are terms that are mis misogynistic, homophobic, and transphobic, and then also the use of sexual language and gestures or sexual joking, which can create a hostile environment for youth and then also for staff. There is sexual ex exploitation, which can come in the form of gang members targeting a certain youth due to their vulnerability, or a staff member compelling a young person to expose themselves to do sexual acts. We are also hearing more often of ritualistic abuse by gangs, mostly in adult prisons, but uh, just to give you some more information, this form of abuse is ritualistic in the way gang members will target the most vulnerable person, and then ritualistic abuse them every day at the same time until that person is completely desensitized to the violence and accepts the abuse as part of the daily routine. We also have domestic violence and battering. So just like in the community, dating violence occurs between adolescents and facilities. Abuse within intimate or romantic relationships may not be as easily recognized by adults because all sexual relationships are not allowed in youth facilities. And the fact that a rule has been broken within the facility can overshadow the dynamics of the relationship. So just like in the community, sexual abuse and coerced sexual activity is often part of abusive relationships. Excuse me. So finally, where sexual abuse is more broadly defined, rape is usually defined by your jurisdiction's penal code. So it's usually the penetration of a body opening with a body part or object. A term that you may not be familiar with and, and is unique to an incarcerated setting is the term protective pairing, which refers to an arrangement where one resident demands sex in exchange for protection or assistance. Common terms in facilities uh, are hooking up or getting married, and it's where one party yields ultimate power and control, and rigid gender roles are enforced. Even in same-sex relationships, you'll see the less powerful person forced into servitude. And they mimic you know, similar dynamics to um, dating violence in the community. <clears throat> 
And then staff on youth violence. The thing to remember is that staff perpetrators have total power and control. Staff may, advantage, may take advantage of their authority by coercing youth or threatening a youth with discipline if the youth refuses to engage in a sexual act or attempts to report the staff member's conduct. Because youth are denied many basic privileges while they're incarcerated, staff may use offers of food, entertainment, protection, money, clothing, or other items as a means of luring youth into sexual relationships. And then youth may also seek out or accept affection from staff as a replacement for relationships with family members. That's also important to keep in mind. So the next slide here, we see that these methods um, are, are shown here in escalation. In youth facilities, you'll often see offers of protection, coercion, and use of authority to carry out sexual violence more than physical force. This is because most perpetrators, with the exception of sexual sadists, will use the least amount of force necessary to carry out this type of violence because it leaves the least amount of evidence. And if investigations are based solely on the collection of DNA samples, it tends to be impossible to prove. We'll now shift the conversation to talk about the impact of sexual abuse in youth detention. We're now joined by Troy Isaac, who will be speaking with Derek to share with us his experiences following sexual abuse in youth detention. Thanks so much, Vivian. I'm so glad Troy is able to join me today for this conversation about the impact of sexual abuse. Troy is a JDI Survivor Council member and local Los Angeles advocate. He dedicates himself to eradicating homelessness, advancing the rights of sex workers, and mentoring LGBTQ youth. Troy has spoken out about the abuse he suffered in numerous media. He's met with his congressman and has been featured in the New York Review of Books and the Huffington Post. We thank him so much for joining us today. So the first question, Troy, I have for you is, can you tell us a little bit about what landed you in youth detention and then also what happened to you while you were there? Sure. Um, thank you to Vivian, our moderator, and thank you to JDI for having me. Um, my family uh, moved to Burbank when I was 12 years old. I was a little black kid with no direction. I was effeminate. I was small, skinny. I wanted to be accepted. I wanted to be respected. I really didn't know the direction that I was going in my life, so I find myself getting in trouble. Um, and in Burbank, um, I found myself throwing rocks um, at abandoned cars, um, staying out late after 10 o'clock. And when you do that, um, you end up in handcuffs, you end up being taken into um, the police station, and that increases your record. So um, for me, um, being in Burbank, I knew that I was different. Um, I, I felt different, but I just couldn't put my finger on what it was that made me so different. Um, I got in trouble when uh, one uh, girl uh, said that my sister wasn't an actress. So I threw lettuce at her. And that ended me in um, the police station, which ultimately led me to serve three years in the California Youth Authority. And at that time, going through juvenile halls, um, staff members uh, disrespecting me. Um, I had problems with gang members there because I was effeminate and I was skinny and I was afraid and they took advantage of me. Uh, they called me anti-gay names, encouraged people to do horrible things to me. I spent 24 years in and out of the system. Uh, when I was in California Youth Authority, I went into a room with a young person probably about a year or so older than me and he forced me to oral copulate him and he put my arms in a military type lock and it really caused trauma to me. So for many of those years I was sexually abused by someone at some time. Troy, I know that this is incredibly painful to talk about, and we really appreciate your willingness to share your experiences with us. So while the focus of you know, the conversation will be on the impact of sexual abuse in youth facilities, 
on, on survivors, we also want to acknowledge that this violence is disabling for the facility. It, it really makes facilities less safe. So let's move on to the, some of the common effects of sexual abuse and detention. While many of the reactions are similar to what survivors experience in the community, incarceration tends to exasper exacerbate the trauma of sexual violence. Um, first off, there's post-traumatic stress disorder, which can develop following any kind of traumatic event. As we mentioned earlier in this broadcast, a, a majority of survivors, which were youth survivors, which was 81% of them, were abused multiple times and in, usually by multiple people. And so conditions of PTSD can become even more severe with each new trauma. Then there's rape trauma syndrome, which is a form of post-traumatic stress disorder, and it describes the feelings, thoughts, reactions, or symptoms that frequently occur after sexual assault. So RTS, as we will call it for short, is a normal reaction to an abnormal level of stress. Symptoms include hypervigilance, which is an exaggerated startle. It's a response uh, mechanism that, that you get where everything is frightening. There's also the symptoms of nightmares, anxiety, insomnia, and then also depression. So youth who are in detention are already uh, in the demographic groups that are at risk for suicide. So combine that with being sexually assaulted, and it really heightens the risk for suicidal thoughts or attempts. And then um, finally, um, sexual assault worsens pre-existing psych psychiatric disorders and previous trauma symptoms. Now, Troy, for you, would you share with us some of these effects for you when you were a young person? Uh, well, me, um, anxiety was really big. Um, depression um, was really big. Um, I was raped in the showers, um, so the perpetrators took advantage of me uh, while I was taking a shower. So there is always a thought, you know, in, in the back of my head, um, when I'm taking showers or when I'm talking to someone. So it's very traumatic um, for me that I have to relive that um, being 39 now. Um, I've cut on my wrist. I've tried to commit suicide just to get attention from someone to help me. Um, so it was, it was difficult um, for me. Thank you so much, Troy. And, and based on what you just shared with us, it, it's really clear that survivors of sexual abuse face insurmountable odds to regain a sense of self, even years later. But now let's add to how the impact of detention can make things uh, more difficult for a young person who's been sexually abused. The first thing I would like to point out is that children generally identify strongly with their families, whether those families have met their needs or not. And while they're incarcerated, they are in the care of people who are not their family. So in custody, they have little control over their own bodies and their environment. They have little or no say about the noises around them, the lights, or the people that they have interactions with. They're told when to wake up, when to shower, eat, and, sa and staff can path search them at any time. Uh, residents don't have the same privacy that we do in the community when showering, toileting, or dressing, or in their phone calls or letters. And the stress of living in a detention environment can exacerbate the symptoms of RTS. Pat and strip searches can be excruciating for sexual assault survivors, particularly if they were abused by staff. And then also keep in mind that during a sexual assault, a survivor loses all control. And in order to heal, survivors need to regain their power and control. And, and this can be very challenging to do in a detention facility. Um, residents who report sexual abuse may perceive that they are being punished for coming forward. So although the use of segregation is becoming less common in youth facilities, many survivors are still placed in isolation for, for safety. Uh, this may be a relief for some, but also terrifying for others. And consider that segregation is likely to only feel safer for youth who are abused by other youth. And even in cases, most survivors find prolonged isolation to be stressful and also disruptive to their daily lives. 
Segre and, and I just want to reiterate that segregation is less common than it used to be, and more youth are placed in their own rooms or transferred to another unit nowadays. And for inmates who were abused by staff, being in isolation often means that the perpetrator or his or her, her co-workers can have greater access to the survivor, which can result in further abuse and then also further retaliation. And also, last point I want to make about this is that incarcerated survivors have well-founded fears of retaliation and re-victimization. Many will have ongoing contact with the perpetrator and his or her friends, which, whether that's another youth or a staff member. There's also the fears of retaliation or simply being labeled a snitch, which adds to the anxiety and the hyper-alertness which are associated with RTS. Um, and then once somebody has been labeled a victim, they are much more likely to be sexually assaulted again, particularly if they couldn't report or if the perpetrator wasn't held accountable if they did report. Now, Troy, going back to you, what was it like for you to be in youth detention following a sexual assault? Um, for me, I was alone. I, I was very alone. And just like when I was with my family, I was alone then, uh, so it was extremely difficult for me because I had nobody to talk to. Nobody wanted to help me. I was completely alone and made to suffer alone, and it was very hurtful, and uh, it made me feel like I was in a box and I couldn't get out. Okay, thank you so much, Troy. So now we're going to talk about the long-term effects of sexual violence. Uh, adolescents are still developing you know, every part of them. Their emotions, health, intellect, sexuality, and sense of themselves is, is still developing. Uh, sexual abuse is, is really a life-changing event, and it interrupts this development. And the abuse has long-term effects. It may affect future relationships. Youth who are abused can become much more sexually active than they were before, or avoid sex and sexual feelings at all costs. Um, some survivors may never have healthy sexual relationships because their sense of boundaries can be permanently damaged, and they might have sex to gain a sense of control of their bodies. Um, if they've been taught that they have to perform sexual acts to get their needs met, this can completely destroy someone's sense of self-worth. And then all trauma victims can develop addictions to drugs or alcohol as a coping mechanism uh, because it works temporarily to numb feelings. And what we know from the research is that trauma survivors are at a greater risk for HIV and STIs in the long term. Having lower self-esteem and living with addictions can lead someone to take greater risks sexually and not feel entitled to set safe boundaries for themselves. There's also the long-term effects of depression, and then also, uh, people who are abused in detention have higher rates of ending back in the system. Many survivors find it hard to work and may turn to the underground economy to survive, such as selling drugs um, or doing sex work, or even just stealing to survive. So, Troy, for you, um, can you talk about some of the long-term impacts for you? Um, for me, you know, I've had, I've had a lot of long-term impacts, but I decided, I decided that I need to take back my life. Um, I decided that um, I needed to help others to feel at peace, not, at, not in pieces. Um, I am still triggered um, by people. When people touch me the wrong way, I get agitated. Um, but my agitation uh, sometimes may come out wrong. Um, so, it, because it's a trigger, it's a, it's a trigger uh, for me. Uh, trusting people um, used to be hard for me. Uh, now I am trusting um, until, you, until you do something that I'm unable to trust you anymore. Um, so, you know, long-term um, effects, um, self-worth, um, understanding that I need to value my life and to be worthy and to love myself more, uh, which at one time was not the case. Um, I'm 39 now, I'm 39, and in the past year, uh, I've had uh, sexually transmitted uh, infections because I wasn't caring for myself the way that I needed to care for myself because I was so prone 
to being disrespected, to being hurt by others. And I thought that's how life is supposed to be. And I've taken back my life. It's a slow process, but now I understand myself. Worth, love comes first, and being able to help those in need is my biggest, biggest, huge blessing. It's, it's so nice to hear that, Troy, and, and thank you for all the work you've done on behalf of uh, survivors. We really appreciate your participation today in this webinar. So the next thing and the last final thing I want to talk about is access to services. So young people can't talk to somebody without making a report. If they tell an adult, that person is usually a mandated reporter. So kids in the community usually have the option to call a hotline, weigh their decisions, and then also talk about their options with the compassionate adult. Most teenagers know that they can't talk to an adult without an adult telling in a facility, which makes it harder for those, for those who have been abused, and why access to confidential anonymous counseling on a hotline might indirectly encourage reporting, or at least provide help for those who are too scared to make a report. It can be very difficult for youth survivors to ask help from staff when their colleagues did nothing to protect them in the first place. Uh, also, some youth facilities may offer limited services, and, and this is now changing because of PREA. But in the past, any assistance a resident could receive would have been obtained in the same environment where the abuse occurred. And in the past, uh, youth would have had no choice in the service providers, and often are forced to receive medical and mental health care from practitioners with no specialized knowledge or training in sexual assault. Uh, because of the PREA standards, not only will youth like Crystal and Troy have access to medical and mental health staff who have specialized training, uh, they can also get help from community advocates like yourself to help them recover and then also help them heal, even after they're released. Thank you, Derek, and thank you so much, Troy, for that discussion. You know, access to rape crisis services can be one of the single most important factors in a survivor's healing. And if you aren't there for these survivors, who will be? While Carolina is um, compiling the questions for the question and answer period, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the other webinars in this series uh, on youth detention. The second webinar in the series will cover the nuts and bolts of building partnerships between community service providers and youth corrections. We'll consider the trauma-informed approach of the PREA standards and share how to develop memoranda of understanding with corrections agencies to start to provide services. In the third webinar, we'll discuss the unique services that you can provide to youth um, survivors, and we'll review the range of opportunities to help youth and hear from survivors about which services would have most benefited them while they were abused. Uh, Carolina, are you ready for us now? Yeah, um, this question is for Wesley. Um, in your section, um, what ages of youth were you referring to? This is from Aminda. Oh, one second. There you go, Wesley. Sure. So uh, in terms of gender identity and sexual orientation, these kinds of things are actually formed at a very, very early age, um, as young as three to five years old. But when I was talking about the data around young people and the juvenile justice system, uh, a lot of that information came from uh, several different sources. But one of them um, was uh, a survey that included young people that were uh, between 11 years old and 21 years old. Um, I believe the average age was around 15. Uh, but it, it varies by state and jurisdiction as to how old young people can be when they are incarcerated. Here in Louisiana, um, the, the stories that I was telling about young people, they all ranged from age 12 on up to 21. Great, thank you. Um, and then this one's for Jody. Um, Jason asked, what, suggest what suggestions are there in regards to alternatives to keeping female youth from being incarcerated in the first place? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, I think that there, uh, I think some of the alternatives are, are to look at the system and, and how and why um, young women are getting, getting 
sent to these facilities and, and are, are being brought into the juvenile justice system. Um, some of this has to do with uh, providing better support for the, the trauma and mental health concerns that, that these young women are experiencing in their communities. Um, in addition, it's also looking at the, 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 the reason behind why courts believe that uh, young women who ran away um, from home should be locked up, um, while, while young men who do that are not necessarily locked up. Um, there's some uh, double standards there about how, um, how, how, women, how young girls and women um, can and should be behaving, and when, um, when young women are acting outside of those, those, uh, those boundaries, uh, the system often um, comes, hard, comes down on them very hard. Great, fantastic. Um, this one, another one for you, Jody. Um, Jacqueline asks, what if the complaint is coming from someone that has filed many complaints that are unfounded? Are those taken at the same level of seriousness and investigated the same? Um, I think, actually, I'm going to pass this one off to Derek. Carolina, can you ask that question one more time? Sorry. Um, Jacqueline right asks, what if the complaint is coming from someone that has filed many complaints that are unfounded? Are those taken at the same level of seriousness and investigated the same? I would say so. I mean, if you have numerous complaints from numerous people, um, not to say that there is something going on, but it, it should be taken as seriously. And there should be paperwork documenting that an investigation has been completed. Um, even if it does take you know one or two, two days to complete the investigation, just for um, your own facility's um, compliance. Yeah. Right. Um, and I'm going to add to that too uh, um, that um, just because a complaint has has been found to be unfounded doesn't mean that that the incident didn't actually occur. There there's a lot of reasons why a complaint could be unfounded um, related to um, an inability to gather evidence um, that uh, the there were, no, there were no witnesses. Uh, uh, other people were unwilling to talk to the investigators, and so um, be, being unfounded is different than a complaint being frivolous. And so, if it was unfounded, um, the complaint should still uh, future complaints should still be investigated to the same level. Right. Um, okay, and this question is for Wes, Wesley. Um, Laura says, ideally, how should pat downs or searches and housing be handled for transgender youth? So uh, this is, of course, the need for uh, these kinds of policies to exist for each facility uh, to have an LGBT policy that specifically lays these kinds of things out. Um, for in, in terms of best practices, um, pat downs and searches uh, for gender nonconforming or transgender youth. Um, ideally, the young person would be consulted in, in terms of uh, what they preferred and who they felt safest and most comfortable with. Um, the same is actually true for housing. So for transgender and gender non-conforming youth, um, it ideally would be done on a case-by-case -case basis where uh, that young person's uh, preference and where they felt safest would be taken into consideration. So oftentimes, transgender girls prefer to be housed with other girls, and there's several jurisdictions that are doing that, including here in New Orleans um, and also in Hawaii. They've been doing that for a number of years, and it's been very successful. Other places have uh, allowed transgender girls or transgender boys to have rec time with the gender that they identify with, um, and that has also been very successful. Uh, I, I wonder if at the end of this we could send out a list of resources that will direct people to some of those best practice policies. Yep, um, we can absolutely do that. Um, okay, next question. Um, Wesley, Chris asks, are there distinctions in the experiences and safety issues for lesbian versus gay youth and also for transgender girls versus trans transgender boys? If so, how might these differences inform detention facilities' policies to create safer environments? Absolutely. So um, again, so in terms of housing, for example, oftentimes transgender girls might feel safe as being housed with other girls. Um, however, there are often transgender boys 
who might still be prefer uh, might still prefer to be housed with girls. Uh, that's typically um, not in, in every case, but often in facilities, the girls' unit is uh, a little bit safer. Um, sometimes the girls' unit is smaller. I mean, I, I know in terms of here in New Orleans, the girls are um, housed in a much smaller place than the boys are. Uh, it really, and, and that's that's sort of speaks to why these things need to be on a case by case basis. Uh, for transgender boys, I've known one facility that would house them in uh, with girls, and they preferred that. But then they would wreck with the other boys and ran other boys up and down the basketball court, uh, and was well accepted on that on that unit during wreck time. Uh, in terms of uh, the experiences inside of detention or long-term secure facilities or youth prisons, uh, there's definitely differences there as well. So uh, for um, gay-identified boys or transgender girls that were unfortunately housed with boys in youth prisons, uh, there have been just a number of, I've spoken with a number of young people over the years that have uh, had all sorts of complaints of physical violence, sexual violence, psychological violence. Um, for girls housed in girls' facilities, they have also complained of very similar things, but they often will play out in a different way. Um, we've had lesbian-identified girls who appeared or presented their gender in a more masculine way would uh, be assumed to be uh, sexual perpetrators, or they would assume to be uh, be assumed to be more aggressive in nature. Um, there's just a lot of different layers to this issue, and um, if it's actually there's uh, the report that I authored, locked up and out, goes through some of those particular experiences and young people sharing their stories, which kind of um, you know talks through the, some of those differences as young people just talk about their experiences. That's great. Thank you, Wes. Um, this question is actually for Troy. Um, Troy, Roger asks, did you feel the staff in the facility knew that you were abused? Yes. The staff knew that I was abused. And when I first went in, um, I didn't know how to fight. Um, but eventually, I, I learned uh, how to fight. And um, I found uh, two... Uh, staff members um, when I was in juvenile hall and we're now friends now and I'm 39 and we're now friends uh, we got reunited uh, with each other and we actually talk about um, when I was in juvenile hall and um, they vowed to me that they want to make a difference um, in the lives of other people and um, they are actually gay men um, and they're openly out now. That's great, Troy. Um, I'm really glad that that's, that, um, that's been there for you. Uh, yes, I'm very happy. Um, so this question is for Derek. Um, yes. Derek B. asks, I'm a sexual assault nurse examiner. Why is the focus on outside community services? Isn't it just as important to have these services inside the institutions? Yes, um, yes, and then also no. It depends on uh, what you mean. If it's for the forensic exam, like let's say a corrections facility that has kind of like hospital services, um, instead of like transporting the victim to kind of like an outside um, community hospital. Um, I, so I think that would be more ideal, but when it comes to outside advocates, um, the standards really recognizes that having an outside support system is um, it, it's more beneficial to survivors instead of having an advocate that works for the facility um, for a, a number of many different reasons. But um, this question we will go over in part two and then also especially in part three of uh, the series. So if you can uh, hang on for those, uh, we can go into greater, greater detail about that. 
Great. Um, and so I think, I'm not sure <laughs> that we will be able to answer this, but um, I'm going to give this question to Jody. Um, in the past five years or so, how many confirmed sexual assaults in juvenile facilities in the, U in the U.S. have there been? That's from Chance. Um, that, that's a, I, I don't have that, that answer off the top of my head, um, but I can definitely, um, we can definitely get back to um, get that information out to, to those that attended. Um, the, the Bureau of Justice Statistics uh, does a surveying of young people in, in juvenile facilities, asking them about their experiences with sexual abuse, um, and, and I think that might be on a, on a yearly basis, if not it's a, an every other year basis. And so looking at some of those numbers, um, you'd be able to, to find that. Um, it's also important to realize that not all young people will report um, sexual abuse out of fear of retaliation, fear that they won't be believed. And so the numbers that of young people who are sexually abused in these facilities are not necessarily, um, the, the, um, where they tell somebody, are not necessarily the, the full picture. Okay. And Carolina, I think we have time for two, maybe three more questions. Okay. Um, this one is for from Joanne for Wesley. Can you explain the Q in LGBTQ more? How is it different from bisexual? Sure. So the Q, uh, we typically will just reserve for questioning. Um, and that, of course, can be, uh, especially for young people, really important. Uh, letter to include because young people are going through adolescent development and questioning all sorts of things, um, potentially including their sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, Q, however, can also stand for queer. Queer is a term that historically uh, was a negative yeah. term uh, which people have started to reclaim and will use as more of a political identity or maybe as an umbrella term uh, for someone that feels that they don't fit quite within any of the, the scope of, of the other letters. Uh, but because it is still thought of in some communities as an offensive term, we typically will just tell folks to uh, reserve the cue for questioning unless someone identifies themselves as queer, in which case, of course, uh, it's, it's okay to to use that and respect that person's identity as queer. Thank you. Um, this question comes from Amanda um, for you, Derek. Um, okay. does, a, does a parent or legal guardian need to provide consent for their child to receive sexual assault services? Um, I'm going to reserve, I, I mean, I'm going to get back to you offline about that because it, it always depends on kind of like your jurisdiction where you live. Um, and in California, you don't, but I'm not sure where you're from. Um, and we, we will actually also be covering this in part three of the series kind of in, in detail. But I would love to talk to you offline about it if, if you're available. Um, and I think that's it, actually. Great. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks for all the great questions, everyone. And um, you can contact my colleague Derek Murray if you have any more questions. Uh, don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And thank you everyone for joining us today.